Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 13th Annual John Glenn Lecture in Space History. We inaugurated the Glenn Lecture in 2004. It quickly became one of our most popular annual events, and tonight is no exception. Our program this evening will feature a historic conversation between a legendary space pioneer and a visionary rocket entrepreneur. In addition to those of you lucky enough to secure tickets, many more will be watching on a live web uh, webcast, which also will be in our archive. So if you want to review it sometime in the future. The uh, John, uh, Senator Glenn can't be with us tonight, but he sends his best regards. His accomplishments as a pilot, astronaut, statesman are all a great inspiration for all of us. Thank you to our speakers for being here tonight. Mr. David Rubenstein co-founder and co-CEO of the Carlisle Group, Regent of the Smithsonian, will be tonight's moderator. Mr. Jeff Bezos, founder and CEO of Amazon.com and Blue Origin, is here to discuss what it will take to unlock spaceflight for everyone, everywhere. And coming home tonight is Major General Michael Collins, who once held what some have called the best job in the world, director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. <laughs> Welcome back. As the founding director, General Collins was responsible for the design and construction of this building, which opened as a bicentennial gift for American people on July 1st, 1976. More than 327 million visitors have walked through this museum since it opened, which is why we're renovating it. <laughs> the, uh, it confer <laughs> our doors in confirming that the museum he built, like the ship he flew to the moon, is a priceless national treasure. In just two weeks, on July 1st, we will celebrate four decades of unparalleled success and rededicate our main gallery, the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. That gallery, where so many millions have discovered the story of flight, is one of the world's great public spaces. And we have Boeing to thank for helping us reinvent it for the decades ahead. Over many years, Boeing has partnered with the Smithsonian on countless important projects from supporting the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall and the Boeing Aviation Hangar at the Stephen F. Udrahazi Center uh, in Chantilly, Virginia, to sponsoring the John Glenn Lecture Series. We would not be the museum we are today without their support. On behalf of the museum and our past, present, and future visitors, I want to thank Boeing for their steadfast support. We look forward to celebrating the, comp the company's centennial anniversary, along with our 40th anniversary, along with our country's 240th anniversary, all on the 1st of July, where we'll have an all-nighter and you're all invited. <laughs> when I disapproved that the first time, they came back and said, you're not the target audience. <laughs> So I'll get it started, and I hope you have a great time. <laughs> the, uh, it's a, over the many, uh, let's see, I guess I better get on to the next. It's now a great pleasure to introduce the Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of the Boeing Company, company Mr. Dennis Muldenberg. Dennis? All right, well, uh, good evening. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, Jack, thank you for that uh, kind introduction and the kind words about the Boeing Company. Uh, we are honored uh, to support and partner with you in the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, it's a really important mission. And uh, thank you as well for your leadership and uh, your service to our country. And let, let's give Jack a well-deserved hand. And uh, as, uh, as General Daly said, uh, this is an exciting year for us, the uh, 40th anniversary of the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, Boeing will be celebrating its centennial. Uh, we'll be 100 years old on July 15. We'll have that early celebration on July 1, as, as you said. And uh, it's one that's involved all aspects of aerospace. And we think about during that first century of, uh, of aviation, uh, people went from uh, walking on the earth to walking on the moon. And we went from uh, riding horses to flying in airplanes and spaceships. It's been an incredible journey and, and Boeing's been honored to be a part of that. 
And tonight it's my privilege to introduce uh, uh, the speakers and, and moderator that will be leading tonight's discussion around space. And I can tell you personally as a space enthusiast uh, how excited I am that this is the, the topic for tonight. Uh, first of all, again, I want to recognize uh, Michael Collins. It's a, it's a privilege to have a, a national hero here with us tonight. And uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, when I told my 15-year-old son that I was going to meet him uh, this evening, uh, he said, no way. Right? <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, he's, he's done a lot to inspire the country. And I, I think we can all remember back to uh, the Apollo 11 mission, whether we saw it real time or have, have seen it since. Uh, Boeing was proud to be part of the Apollo missions, but the inspiration that that created and the long-term impact to our country and to the world is, uh, is well recognized. So it's, it's great to have Michael here with us tonight, the command uh, module pilot for the Apollo 11 mission. Uh, also uh, tonight, it's a great privilege for us to be here with uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, one of the great entrepreneurs of our time, a uh, great business leader, and another space enthusiast. And uh, among other things, at the Boeing Company, we have the privilege of working with Jeff and his uh, Blue Origin team on a uh, future rocket engine and, uh, and space opportunities. But uh, more broadly than that, Jeff is, and his team are breaking barriers in low cost, reliable space access and just fundamentally changing the equation about how we'll get to space in the future. And that is exciting to see and, and we're honored to partner with you in, uh, in aspects of that and uh, thanks for your leadership as well. And then uh, lastly, I'd like to recognize David Rubenstein as well. David's been a great friend and a business leader, community leader, philanthropist, well known here in the Washington DC community and more broadly, also a great historian, a great, uh, a great fan of the space business and, uh, and also a great supporter of the National Air and Space Museum. And uh, David will be our moderator uh, this evening. So if I could, I'd like to welcome all three of you fine gentlemen uh, up to the stage here. And we look forward to the discussion. And my, uh, I think my last duty here, you. you're going to get it? Oh. My last duty here was to try to make this uh, podium descend. Now, I'm an engineer by training, so I suspect this was the real reason for my invitation tonight. <laughs> it works. And look at that. That's Boeing technology there. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. All right, gentlemen, it's good to see you. Okay, so how many people here would like to go into space? Okay, how many people would like to go to the moon? Okay. All right, you're going to hear a lot about that tonight. Uh, but first, when we start, um, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, let me ask you each an uh, individual question first. Um, if um, Michael Collins, um, you were the first director of this museum. Getting it off the ground, getting the money for it and so forth, was doing that harder than getting to the moon? <laughs> <laughs> I think it probably would have been, and except it was for Barry Goldwater who wanted badly to get this museum uh, underway. And what he told me was, uh, if you're ever here with a kin, please mention them. So I'd be delighted to mention that I'm here with my daughter Kate from Chicago, who uh, to some of you soap opera fans is better known as Natalie, and uh, Anne from Boston now. Anne, I don't know about a space buff, I asked her, suppose she had been in Neil Armstrong's shoes, would she have said, uh, one small step for a woman? She shot by <laughs> No, does this suit make me look fat? Um, so maybe that's why she was not picked. I don't know. Okay. All right, and Jeff, you've built one of the greatest technology companies in the world. In just 20 some years, you've taken a company from nothing to Amazon, which everybody in the world now knows and, and most people in the world seem to use. Was that harder to do than trying to get a uh, space uh, company off the ground, which is more of a challenge to you? Totally different challenges. So one of the things that uh, I find, if I think back on the last 20 years, you have to remember 20 years ago, I was driving the packages to the post office myself in my 1987 Chevy Blazer, dreaming that one day I might be able to afford a forklift. And the internet, that's 1995. 
And you know, 21 years later, the internet is this gigantic thing, and there are many, many successful companies. And the entrepreneurial dynamism that you see on the internet is incredible. And really, with Blue Origin, you know, that, that this new challenge that I'm taking on with Blue Origin, what I want to do is put the heavy lifting infrastructure in place so that the next generation can have a, a, a dynamic entrepreneurial explosion of ideas and inventions in space, just like we've had with the internet. And the reason you can't do that today is because there's just too much heavy lifting involved, literally. You know, getting to space is so expensive and so hard. When, when we started Amazon, I didn't have to build a logistics infrastructure system to deliver parcels. There was something already, UPS already existed and the US Postal Service already existed. I didn't need to build a remote payment system. There were already credit cards. Uh, and similarly, you know, there were computers around and uh, you know, that didn't have to get, all those things would have been tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of infrastructure. The long distance phone network became the backbone of the internet, but it already existed. And so you could have this dynamic entrepreneurial explosion because all the heavy capex infrastructure was in place. For space, it's not like that. The price of admission is so high. So that's the big difference. And what I'm super excited about is lowering that cost. I want to dramatically lower that cost so that 20 years from now, a new generation of people with startup money, real, real entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs, can do amazing things in space. Think how cool that would be. Yeah, let me do a follow-up with you. Why is it that the people who are trying to build great space companies now all have day jobs doing something else? Richard Branson has a day job. Um, Elon Musk has a day job. You have a day job. Why don't people have full-time jobs just getting people into space? Why is it only people like you who have day jobs are doing all these things? Well, for one thing, it's expensive. You need a lucrative day job so you can afford your night job. <laughs> it's, um, uh, and, and, you know, it, Blue Origin is, I think, going to be a profitable business one day. I certainly want it to be. I think that's healthy and it would be, you know, you want businesses to be self-sustaining so they can do amazing things. But it needs a lot of funding and it needs a lot of funding for a long time in that investment phase. Um, and so I'm very happy to do that. But that's why I can only do it because I was lucky with Amazon. Right. Michael, let me ask you a question. Um, this is something that's hard to believe. You landed in, on the moon in July, of, or you and your team landed on the moon in July of 1969. And we're going to get into that in a moment. But why do you think so many people in the world, or at least some people in the world, still think that it was fake and that it was actually in a studio? And uh, was there a studio you actually filmed this in, or where did it, where did it happen? Well, you know, I'd love to get them all together in one room, you know, and pick their brains. I think it'd be fun. Well, the, the Wright brothers uh, flew in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and I think it was December 17th. And uh, the evening before the 16th, uh, every year they, they, they have the meeting of the Man Will Never Fly Society. And uh, one year I was their guest speaker. It was one of the finest speeches I've ever made. And. Uh, I was forced to reveal that it did take place if you drive south out of um, Kitty Hawk, there's this gigantic sand dune just past the village of Rodanthe, and we'd film just on the other side of that. <laughs> and, and my proof is, if you look at the unretouched NASA photographs, you, know, you see a, a crushed pack of Marlboros over here and a Dr. <laughs> Pepper can over there. Well, that's proof, man. Uh, so I, uh, okay. what was your question again? Well, what? <laughs> so, uh, okay, for both of you, um, in the heyday of the um, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo program, everybody's attention was cap captured by it, captivated by it. Congress was putting up money. Everybody seemed to want to have the astronauts go to where they were going. Everybody wanted to be an astronaut. Why do you think the U.S. government has basically receded a bit in its mission to go back to the moon or to go to Mars and why is it that entrepreneurs are now leading the effort there's nothing wrong with that but where is the US government is it a case of done there done that been there and I don't want to do it anymore yes but for both of you um, well I think most most things uh, especially in the world of economics and the economy are, are cyclical and uh, and, and, and we came to kind of a crest of the wave in the latter days of the Apollo program, and that momentum was hard to keep going. Uh, I think we're in a time of a hiatus now, and I think the momentum has possibilities of picking up again. I hope so. To me, the focus should be on Mars. Um, my friend Neil Armstrong, who is a far better engineer than, than I, uh, thought it was worthwhile to 
uh, stop off and get a little more organized on the moon before heading on to Mars. I disagree with that. I think we ought to just go. I used to joke that I, I thought NASA should be renamed the NAMA, the National Aeronautics and Mars Association. And I still, uh, to some extent, would like to see that. But anyway, on to Mars. Right, so why do you think it is that the U.S. government basically has receded a bit and entrepreneurs have the opportunity to do it? Do you think there's some way to recapture the U.S. government's interest in this? Well, I, don't, I think if you think back to the kind of the heyday of the 1960s and the Apollo program and the, all of that excitement, I, I, my, my, my gut instinct on this is that we as a civilization, we as humanity, pulled that moon landing way forward out of sequence from where it actually should have been. It was a gigantic effort with what is... Uh, in many ways, it's, it should have been impossible. And they pulled it off with you know, barely any computational power. They were still using slide rules. They couldn't numerically model in computers a lot of these important processes like combustion inside a rocket engine, which is still hard today, but we can do it a little bit. Um, they didn't have computational fluid dynamics to really, under everything had to be done in a wind tunnel. Nothing could be done on a computer. So my, I, I think the reason we've sort of taken a hiatus, maybe, in part at least, is because we, did, we pulled that forward to a time when it should have been impossible. And then once it was done, we kind of had to wait and let technology catch up. You know, the reason that Blue Origin and SpaceX and Virgin Galactic and all these companies today, any of these private companies, the only reason that we can do this kind of endeavor at all is because we're standing on the shoulders of NASA who invented all of this technology. We're still using all the things that they invented back in the 60s. We have refined versions of it. Um, but even the computer codes that we use to validate our designs have been you know, honed and, 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 and fine-tuned by NASA over decades. So this is, um, uh, I, I think we're finally entering, I believe that we are entering a new golden age of space and space exploration and that the time has come for that to happen because we as a species have have uh, up, up leveled ourselves in terms of technology we're ready to do it now it's amazing that we did it in 1969 so um, it's crazy let's suppose the next president of the United States we're having a presidential election everybody knows that and uh, whoever is elected suppose that person calls you up and says I want to jump start the uh, space program Give me some advice. What should I do? Should I go to back to the moon? Should I go to Mars? Should I go into no planets? Should I build a space shuttle again? What should I do? And Michael, what would you say to the next president of the United States uh, about how to jumpstart yeah, this program? I, I've never, uh, I'd probably be so nervous I'd drop the telephone. I, uh, I've never had the president of the United States ask me a question like that. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I happen to believe in Mars. I think one of the wonderful things about the Apollo program was what John F. Kennedy said. Uh, he was president. He said, we want a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Simple. I mean, did you have questions about that? You, maybe you have something about that you didn't understand? I mean, we all understood what it was, what we were supposed to do, and uh, we need something similar to that today. I don't know what that is. Uh, I, as I say, my, the, I have every hope and I, th I think Mars is, is the focus that we should have, but whatever it is we want to do, you need a, a lot of support from the President of the United States. You, you have to have the feeling that he's a man or a woman who thinks about space, likes the exploration of space, thinks it's a worthwhile investment for our government, and puts it pretty high on the priority list. Now, regardless of parties and who you like or don't like, we, we really haven't had that personal involvement of a president, uh, I don't think, since uh, John F. Kennedy, but it was a wonderful help for us to just say what the president said. There it is. It's stark. It's outlined. You, can, you could write it on your thumbnail, and off you go. Jeff, what would you do if the president called you and said, I want to get the government to help entrepreneurs like you and I want to jumpstart public interest in, uh, in space, what would you recommend to them? I think um, uh, big prizes would be an interesting thing to do. So the, just like DARPA has done their DARPA Grand Challenges, to, for, which really kicked off self-driving cars, 
You could, for example, you know, NASA for many years has planned um, and, and, and done quite detailed planning on a Mars sample return mission. So an automated robotic vehicle that goes to Mars, lands on Mars, collects some Mars uh, samples, and then lifts back off and comes back to Earth and brings some Martian samples back. It's a very expensive mission to do. It's a very complex mission to do. Um, the, you know, one thing that the government could do is just offer a very large prize to whoever first brings back some Mars samples. Um, it would be very interesting. It would be uh, uh, that kind of horse race would create lots of attention. Uh, people would compete for it. Um, and uh, who knows how it would end. But it also, if, if nobody brings the samples back, it costs taxpayers nothing. So it's a very um, effective way of getting a lot of interest and a lot of teams competing and trying to come up with creative ways to do that. I also would um, advise that NASA needs to go after gigantic high, hard technology goals. Um, an example would be an in-space qualified nuclear reactor um, uh, for deep space missions. Um, another very difficult, very challenging, not something that private enterprise is going to undertake anytime soon. Another gigantically hard mission that NASA could undertake, which would be very exciting, would be hypersonic point to point travel, so on Earth. But that, the, the, you know, because NASA isn't just about space. So I think prizes and then really hard technology programs. All right. Now, do either of you believe in UFOs? Do you, what do you think happened in Roswell, <laughs> New Mexico? Do you think uh, we've ever had any UFOs in our, in our Earth? Well, one of the horrible things is that word UFO, because anyone who's flown in the night sky or the day sky, occasionally you see something, uh, the Lubbock lights, you know, it's a flock of geese where things just happen to be pointed properly at it. And so have I ever seen a UFO? Yes, I have seen an unidentified object in the sky. Do I think it was inhabited by little green men from far away? No, it's some aberrant uh, lighting condition that caused it. But I'm not answering your question. Well, Ask well, me again. What was the question? Right. Well, on the back side of the moon, when you went on the back side of the moon, you didn't see any little men or women walking around there, did you? No, 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 no. The back side of the moon was kind of nice. You know, I couldn't hear mission control saying, <laughs> Apollo 11, do this, do that, check that, fuck the other. Woo! It was pleasant. Yeah. You, you believe there are UFOs? Do you believe, you believe there's life elsewhere in the galaxy? Oh yes, I think there's life elsewhere in the galaxy, but I do not think they have visited us and they're not abducting people and uh, the, it's not a giant government conspiracy okay. to hide you. No, I think when the UFOs come, if they ever do, they'll make themselves quite visible. Okay. So Michael, let me ask you, how did you first get involved in the space program? You, uh, were, you were a graduate of West Point and you ultimately were a fighter pilot, but how did you get selected? Initially, you weren't selected initially, but how did you get selected? We well, just explained it. Well, <laughs> well, how did you get selected? I, ultimately, you got selected. Well, I mean, I wasn't eight years old and looked up into the night sky and said, the moon's for me. I uh, used to make model airplanes. Oh, by the way, Neil used to make model, Neil Armstrong made model airplanes. He and I, tell me the difference. Um, so that's, mine, how, that's how you get selected, make well, model airplanes? Mine would, would confuse me a little bit. I wasn't sure. We both wanted performance, higher and faster. And, uh, and my solution was to wind the rubber band a little bit more, a couple extra turns. Neil built a wind tunnel. <laughs> you know that? Did you know that? That's I didn't it. know that. Well, anyway, um, so how you I, I, got in, I got into it step by step. I went to... Uh, uh, West Point Military Academy. Uh, uh, my father, my brother, my uncle had all gone there, but fundamentally I, I went there because it was a free education. Then uh, I had a choice, Army or Air Force. My uncle was uh, Army Chief of Staff. I thought, ooh, ooh, nepotism. I snuck off to the Air Force. Then the choice is fly or don't fly. Then fly. Big ones or little ones? Oh, little ones are better than the big ones. Sorry, Boeing workers. <laughs> Uh, but uh, then fly the same ones over and over or fly the new ones. I wanted to fly the new ones. So the next thing you knew, I was a test pilot and NASA was looking for test pilots. It was that simple, just a stair step. So when you finally got selected um, and you get to meet the other astronauts, do you say, how did I get here or how did they get here? No, no, no. We were, <laughs> no, no. Back up a bit. Uh, before there really was a space program, uh, People, uh, this, you know, the bureaucrats or whoever, the scientists, the medics, uh, 
all got together and tried to figure out who, who do they want to hire, what kind of people. And uh, you know, some of the proposals were bizarre. I mean, we couldn't breathe, so we picked mountain climbers. They're used to that stuff. Or you're going to become so enraptured by space, you're not going to want to return. It's similar to some uh, scuba divers. So you get a scuba diver. Some said, no, it's, uh, it's dangerous, so we ought to get yeah, bullfighters, huh? <laughs> and uh, so all these crazy ideas were compiled and filtered and put together in a paper to President Eisenhower. And uh, he said, OK, you've got to be a graduate of an accredited test pilot school. So immediately, this pool of billions, and I, today, NASA's looking for, I think, 12 people, and so f a year or so from now, so far they have over 18,000 applicants today. But if you say you got to be a graduate of an accredited test bot school, that pool just shrinks. And, uh, and so I was very fortunate to be one of few people considered. I'd never make it today, I guarantee you that. Jeff, how do you get interested in space? How do I get interested in space? Um, uh, well, actually, I became inspired uh, when I was five years old, when I watched uh, Apollo 11, you know, this guy and his two pals go to the moon. And um, it was, uh, I could just tell how excited everybody was around me. And you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. And uh, ever since I'm five years old, I've been thinking about rockets and uh, rocket engines and spacecraft pretty much every day of my life. All right, but everybody is a little boy or maybe a little girl as well. They're interested in this space uh, area, but they don't actually go ahead and do the kind of things you did. So what prompted you after you started Amazon to start a whole separate company and how much of your time do you devote to it? Well, I had, uh, I had been hoping to build a space company since I was a little kid. And, um, and then, you know, uh, kind of reality came into play and I realized it was going to be really expensive to start a space company. And then I kind of moved on. I fell in love with computers. And, um, uh, and then I won this kind of lottery called Amazon.com. And then I realized, hey, wait, I can do that original childhood dream now. And so I started this company and um, it employs, well now we're up to about 700 people and uh, we're building a suborbital tourism vehicle which competes with Virgin Galactic and we're gonna, our goal there is to make it possible ultimately for anybody who wants to go to space to be able to afford it. We're just gonna keep working at that goal patiently until we achieve it. And, uh, and then we're also building an orbital vehicle, and uh, we'll, we'll fly that at the end of this decade for the first time. And so it is, you know, and, and, and my, my belief is that to dramatically lower the cost of space, it's all about reusability. You just have to make your vehicles reusable. You can't throw them in the bottom of the ocean every time after you use them if you ever want to dramatically reduce the cost. Now, would you go on one of these space uh, trips yourself? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I fully expect to go into space myself someday. And um, uh, Have you told your family that or your Amazon I'm shareholders? telling them they're sitting here in the front row, okay. so <laughs> I'm telling them right now. Right, no, the they Amazon, know. The Amazon shareholders. They know I can't be kept away. Um, no, I will do it very safely. You know, we, I think that. Um, you know, space travel can be both much lower cost and much uh, more reliable and safe. And, and in fact, I think reusability will add to reliability. So you don't want, you know, I would much rather fly a, a new Boeing 787 after it's been flying a little while, not like the very first flight out of the factory, you know. And so um, the, when you build these space vehicles, you can't send them on, on test runs uh, the way we do them if they're expendable. Their very first mission is also their very last mission. And that just really hobbles you um, in terms of making things safe and reliable. So, Michael, let me ask you, all right, when you're selected to go on Apollo 11, um, was there any jockeying saying, hey, I'd like to be the first man on the moon, I'd like to be the second man on the moon, I'd like to run the command module? How did they decide who would do what? Um, I, you know, there was some small fuss, if I remember correctly, before the flight and maybe a larger one after about who went first, but it seemed to me that Neil Armstrong should have gone first. Uh, he was the commander and uh, that just seemed more appropriate to me and a more normal sequence of events. Uh, and, and I'm glad he did. I think, you know, Neil was uh, just an amazing uh, fellow. He uh, 
uh, at that time there were 30 of us um, in the astronaut office in Houston and uh, of the 30 there was kind of like one here and 29 there in terms of test piloting experience and that was what we considered the single most important yardstick if you will. So Neil was in a way, uh, because of his uh, experience out at Edwards uh, as, a, as a test pilot for NASA, NACA, and then NASA, he was almost in a, just a class by himself. And also I thought personality-wise, people will argue with that. They say, well, he was too reticent. Uh, he, he didn't get out in front and sell the program. But I think from a personality point, he was a superb choice. Uh, I wouldn't want a, uh, I can get it for you, a wholesale PR man out there trying to sell. I, I think that had been dreadful. And uh, so I, I think if you considered uh, the positions in, on the crew, hierarchy, and, and, and the worth of the man, the personality, the sort of person he was, I, I think it was a wonderful choice. So uh, if you, on that flight, uh, you could say there are four complicated parts. Getting off the Earth, you know, you don't know if it's going to work. Yes. Then getting into the moon's orbit, you don't know if that's really going to work. Then having the um, space, the, the, the lunar module go down. Then having the lunar module come back up and hook with you. And then, of course, go back to the Earth. You could say five parts. Which do you think was the most dangerous or that made you the most nervous that would actually not happen? not happen. Well, you know, going to the moon is a, I always liken it to a, a daisy chain. It's a long, complex daisy chain, a lot of lengths, fragile. You break one link, uh, the rest of them don't matter a lot. Um, if, you, if you think of it that way, I, the weakest and the worriest to me was uh, the, uh, getting the lem off the lunar surface. I thought we'd launch okay, we'd get to the moon, we could navigate. You know, someone asked Neil, wasn't the, wasn't the uh, navigation terribly complicated? And Neil had a very nice little dry sense of humor. He said, no, he could see the thing the whole way. <laughs> but uh, so those things, um, those things I was, I was not worried about. But I was worried about uh, the ascent and the rendezvous. They had only, we, we were big on redundancy. We wanted two of everything. But the design of the lunar module was such we just had one ascent engine, one engine bell hanging out of the bottom. That thing had to work or they were stuck there forever. And then things got really complicated from my point of view. Uh, if, if, if they got off on time, burned the engine for the right number of seconds in a precisely the right azimuth, then it was pretty simple. But uh, any variations in their trajectories gave me fits. Uh, you know, sometimes then my strategy would be to drop down into a lower orbit and try to catch them faster. And if they got past a certain point, then my strategy was to go higher and slower and let them make an extra turn around the moon and catch me. I had a, a book around my neck, a big fat eight by 10 uh, notebook kind of thing. And it, I, if I remember right, I think it had 18 variations on this theme. So given the fact that they were uh, Lots could have gone wrong on the lunar surface. Uh, the, that single engine might have had a hiccup. Uh, uh, I might have been able to rescue. I, obviously, I could not go down and land. Uh, but uh, short of that, I obviously had a lot of ways of, of, of rescuing them. But I'm not sure I knew all 18 of them as well as I should okay. have. Uh, you've, you've, uh, you've written and you've uh, said that the most uh, maybe dangerous job that you had was the uh, one of perhaps having to come back by yourself. In other words, you were, you were afraid that perhaps they didn't come back and they were stuck on the moon and you would have to go back by yourself and you lived in fear that people would blame you for some reason that, that you hadn't brought them back. Can well, you talk never, about that? You know, we never discussed that. Uh, but I mean, it was, I think, clear to them and clear to me. I was, uh, if they were stuck, I was not going to commit suicide. I was coming home, but, you know, I'd have been a marked person for the rest of my life. It had been just god-awful, so... Anyway, well, yeah, I should have mentioned coming back to the Earth is not exactly a, a, a you know, day in the park, a walk in the park, because can you describe how difficult it is to get back in the Earth at the right um, uh, rotation, orbit? 
it, it, it wasn't as bad as it sounds. If, if you run the numbers, the arithmetic says, oh my God, if you go a little too steep, you burn up. If you go a little too shallow, you bounce out and we'll, we'll see you six months after you've run out of oxygen. Uh, so those, uh, those numbers are frightening. However, we had, uh, despite what Jeff says about our extraordinarily uh, primitive uh, technology, <laughs> And it was uh, pretty primitive. We had a uh, whole basement full of IBM 506s or whatever they were, and we had antennas in Spain, Canberra. That. So if we got about a, a one hiccup off our um, trajectory on the way back, we were told, notified, made a correction. So all of the way back from the moon, fortunately, we didn't have to make many corrections, but we had the uh, capacity to, instead of flying a nice smooth arc that might have been too high or too low, we were ooh, right exactly on that path. When you came back, there was a fear that you had moon germs with you and that you had to be quarantined for weeks. What was that all about? I mean, I used to pray every night that the mice didn't die <laughs> because we were... You know, we were locked up with, I don't know, dozens and dozens of mice, and suppose they'd gotten Ebola or something. Uh, we'd still, to this day, be in quarantine down there, so. So uh, when you came back here, you've gone all the way up to the moon, you're circling the moon, you've come all the way back, and then you land in the water, and then you take Dramamine pills. I mean, after having done all that, why did you worry about Dramamine? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I didn't take any Dramamine, I don't I, think. I, I thought when, you, when they, um, when you, on the shuttle, when it was landed, on the, uh, the space capsule landed in the water, I thought you were supposed to take Dramamine because the, it, it tilted so much. You, you, uh, well, I lost a case of beers, but uh, in the landing, uh, it was that... Uh, I, I flew it. I flew. We switched seats. Uh, I switched seats with Buzz. He sat where I normally did, and he had. I, I was a navigator coming back, and uh, he was the guy who was in charge of the parachutes, which you know might have been my domain, but it wasn't at that time in the flight. And the thing was, as soon as you hit, uh, he was supposed to push in two circuit breakers, hit these two switches, and the parachutes would jettison. And if he didn't do that swiftly, uh, we'd be caught by the wind and flipped over. And then we'd be upside down for, God, a couple of hours while you had to pump up pumps and re... Anyway, I had a case of beer bet on whether we were or were not going to go over. And he messed it up and we went over and I had to owe him a case of beer. And, it was, <laughs> and we got sick, not physically sick, but we had to upside down for a while and it was a mess, but... Uh, it worked. So, Jeff, um, suppose somebody in the audience here, somebody watching, wants to go to the to the space. Um, where do they sign up? How much does it cost? And when will they be able to do it? Well, for the suborbital uh, mission, uh, we, don't yet, we don't know yet exactly what we're going to charge. It's going to be in the same. Uh, Virgin Galactic is charging, I don't know, somewhere between $250,000 and $300,000 per ticket. We're going to be in the same range to start with um, and then keep working over time to make it cheaper. And when do you think that will be available? Uh, 2018. So we'll fly our first uh, test astronauts in 20, late 2017, hopefully, if, if, the, if the test uh, program continues to go. We're flying again this uh, Friday and are webcasting that so you can watch that. And, but if the test program continues to go well, um, we should be ready to put people on board in late 2017 and then paying astronauts in 2018. And and uh, how can somebody sign up now, or you're not taking names now? No, we're not taking deposits or anything yet. <laughs> and um, in the case of uh, people who do want to go, should they be physically fit, or can they be out of shape? It now, it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's, uh, you don't need to be especially physically fit. There may be a few uh, criteria, but it, it probably, I would think of it as, you will, that'll come later. We'll have more details on what you really need. But it'll, it's probably like, if you can ride a roller coaster, you can probably do this. It's not a... It's not something that requires uh, special uh, physical fitness. And will you be able to order something on Amazon from up there? <laughs> yeah, but you won't be able to get it delivered up there. Yeah, um, but we have, you know, it'll be, uh, you'll be in, it's what Alan Shepard did in the early days. That's what suborbital space is. So instead of going around the Earth, that's orbital. You go up and you come back down. So you're in 
zero gravity for uh, approximately four minutes. Uh, we have the largest windows that will have ever been in space. Um, it's gonna, people who have been to space, we could ask Mike, but I've heard it from many, many people that um, it does change you. It changes the way you think about uh, the Earth and, and humanity and you get to see that thin limb of the Earth's atmosphere and the big blackness of space. And So I think people are going to be very excited about it. Michael, you've written in your book that you wish all government leaders could go to outer space because when you go to outer space you can see the Earth as without boundaries and borders and you kind of realize the fragility is the word you used, how fragile Earth is. Can you comment on that and why you saw the Earth as so fragile when you were up there? Um, you know, the idea of uh, fragility had uh, never occurred to me before the flight, and uh, it was kind of a surprise. Uh, I, speaking of windows, I, I'd say in the command module there were, um, there were five windows, so you want to look at the Earth. Little things, see where you came from and all of that. Oh, you look out a window, number one, nothing black. Window number two, three, four, five. Look through all five windows, you can't, it's not there. So that's, that's a very interesting starting point right there. If you stop and think about it, hey, you spend all your life in this little globe, uh, you're up away from it, you want to know about it, see it, get back to it. It's, it's gone, it isn't there. So, but anyway, obviously you know that sooner or later if you twist the spacecraft and roll and pitch and yaw around in a certain way, it'll hove into view and, uh, and when it does, it's uh, very small, about, about got, a, got a normal um, thumbnail. Hold it up, let me see if it's, yeah, okay, hold it out in front of you. Okay, that's, that's what you see. That's what it looks like from the moon. It's like a, a, a normal thumbnail out in front of you, about that big. That's pretty small. And um, of course, we're mostly, uh, mostly ocean, so uh, you mostly see blue, see, depending on the weather conditions, but you see quite a few clouds. You don't see land so much. Uh, so it's very shiny, the albedo, you know, the amount of uh, sunlight that the that the moon, uh, I mean, excuse me, the Earth reflects as far exceeds that of the uh, moon. But um, somehow this little tiny uh, blue and white sphere looks lovely and clean, which it's, which it's not. It looks uh, uh, fragile, which it is. Uh, I, I don't know why it looks fragile. It's just, that was just my reaction. God, it's a beautiful little thing. Uh, I'll be back in a couple of days, I hope. And, Cool, but in the meantime, it just looks so beautiful and fragile, fragile, fragile. Okay. So let me ask you this. Uh, you and two other men went to the moon and came back safely. Um, that's an incredible bonding experience, but it didn't seem as if going up you were uh, the, the close to each other. You weren't particularly close friends, and afterwards you didn't become even closer friends. What was the nature of the relationship between the three of you? I, I, I loved them both. Uh, our crew was a little, I, I, I think the, one of the books I wrote, uh, uh, I described the crew as amiable strangers, which in a way we were. I didn't mean that in a bad way, but uh, unlike most crews, most crews were formed, first they were a backup crew, nowadays for a couple of years, and then they worked together as a team and became primary crew. Due to a whole set of circumstances, uh, we didn't have that uh, bonding experience. We all came together about six months before the flight. And then the other uh, thing that was a little different is, uh, is, is where these spacecraft are manufactured and where you test them. Uh, uh, Neil and Buzz would be off in Bethpage, uh, Long Island, worrying about Grumman putting the LEM together. I'd be in Downey, California, worrying about the command module. When we got together, no, we weren't together. They're too off in the LEM simulator. I'm in the command module simulator. So just uh, what I would almost call freakish circumstances kept us from being as close as some of the crews. You've now been back on Earth uh, for quite a while, back in 69. Um, you had a chance, though, uh, if you'd stayed in the program, to go back and maybe be a person who went on the moon physically. Why did you choose not to do that and to retire from the space program? Well, it was more a personal thing. Um, I, my wife was from Boston. Uh, I don't think uh, Houston was exactly her first uh, choice of habitat. Uh, and, and I was perfectly happy to be spending more time at home and left in, less in Motel 6 off in East Overshoe somewhere. Um, 
and but I'd have to say underlying that uh, I, I guess I had the wrong attitude in the sense that I thought uh, Apollo 11 was kind of the apex of the program to do what John Kennedy said to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade and I'd help to do that and rather put up with uh, what I thought would be another perhaps three years of, uh, of simulators and motels and this, that, and the other. I, I just felt it, for me it was time to bail out. Okay, and um, the most frequent question you've been asked since you've been back since 1969 is it, what is it like to go to the bathroom in space? Uh, do you really like the food that uh, you get in space or do you really drink Tang? Um, any of those questions. What was the most frequent question you've been asked? Okay, the, 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 the going to the bathroom is, uh, so help me across my heart, never been asked. If I were asked, I'd say the answer is carefully. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, what was the second one, Tang? Tang, what about the food? You ever ask about the food? Well, I used to give, I used to rate the food and I don't think the food preparation people in Houston were too happy, but I'd give it spoons, you know. I think the, you know, the cream of chicken soup is, gets two spoons is all out of five. And so the food was decent. I, you know, for, for eight days, who cares? I, uh, you know, uh, now you want to stay up on a space station for a year like these Scott, uh, Scott guy is doing with his twin brother as a control down here. But and then things like food and the amenities and crew compatibility. You know, crew compatibility is something that the psychiatrist always uh, emphasized. And I can recall uh, sitting next to John Young at a Gemini uh, pre-flight uh, press conference and someone brought up, well, how did I feel about crew compatibility and on this, what was facing us? Uh, you know, I said, come on for four days I'd fly with a baboon and uh, <laughs> and you know John sitting right there he didn't get mad he knew exactly where I was coming from he laughed uh, but that's true you know for a short period of time now the thing is you talk about Mars then woo I'm dead wrong then uh, then you have all kinds of compatibility and physiological and other medical problems. I'm, I'm, I'm rambling on, I'm sorry. Okay, well, did astronauts really drink Tang? That used to be an advertisement. At, during the about Tang, really, we had some kind of uh, orange stuff. I don't know who or what it was. Uh, Jeff, um, you, you're trying to get some people to go into space, but you also have a program to build uh, rockets that can be relaunched for further uh, exploration in space. Yeah. Will the government of the United States ultimately use those for its um, exploration, or who would use those? rockets for, for Yeah, the operation. idea is to build the infrastructure, and once you build the infrastructure to get to uh, Earth orbit, it can be used for just about anything. You can use it for satellites, um, you can use it for uh, human-rated missions, so that's the goal. The goal is to build, uh, we, we want to build a orbital uh, vehicle where the price of the propellant, the fuel, actually matters, where you start to actually think about the cost of fuel. No rocket has ever been built so far in the history of rockets where anybody has ever cared about the cost of the fuel because the fuel cost is so dominated by throwing the hardware away. So it's about, uh, it's about reusability and then reusability will lower the cost enough to where we can practice. So space has been in stasis for 50 years. Um, we launch about uh, maybe 80 missions a year globally all over the world. And uh, that's not even a peak. It's come down a little bit from the peak maybe in the 80s. And so uh, we've gotten better at it as a society, but not appreciably better. And that's because we don't practice enough. You know, we get good, we humans get good at everything we practice a lot. So we need to be flying every day. Um, and when we're flying every day, um, we'll get better. But do you support the idea of sending men and women to Mars? Or why not just send um, robots and pick up whatever's there? Do you think it should be humans? I think or you not? can justify uh, sending men to Mars for. Um, science reasons. I think we have reached a state where robots can do that task probably better than people can and the reason you send people to Mars is because it's so damn cool. It's a, um, it's a glorious human adventure and, uh, and, and we should do that. Now, but it does, you know, it does have to be done at a certain cost and, and we, have a, you know, we have a lot of other priorities. For me, the big thing, I'm excited that I hope somebody goes to Mars because I want to watch it. I think it would be glorious. But for me, that's not, that's not the motivator for me. For me, the motivator is 
I want us to have millions of people living and working in space. We have a planet that is fragile, and I don't think we go into space as a kind of plan B. I hate that idea that we need a backup for Earth is not motivating for me. Um, for me, plan B is make sure plan A works. We know a lot about this solar system, and I can assure you Earth is the best planet. Um, we have looked at them all, and Earth is the best one, and, and we have to protect it. And we can use space to protect Earth. If you take baseline energy usage on Earth and grow it, compound it at just 3% a year, such is the power of compounding, that just in a few hundred years you'll have to cover the entire surface of the Earth and solar cells uh, to power the planet. So this, this is, we need to um, move ultimately over the next few hundred years. We need to be, build a real spacefaring civilization. I think what's going to happen is that we're going to move all heavy industry off Earth and we'll zone Earth residential and light industrial. And uh, we'll protect this glorious jewel of a planet because it is unique in our solar system. Uh, and we're unlikely to get to new solar systems anytime soon. So for both of you, um, when you go into outer space, you look at the Earth, it's very fragile, but there are no boundaries. Do you think it really makes a difference whether it's the United States is taking the lead on this or China is doing it? Why not do it together? Why not have... Is there, is there a for, for big exploration missions, I think you would do it together. If you were going to you know, do that glorious journey to Mars and, uh, and, and, and put uh, boots on Mars or settle Mars or any of the things like that, I think you would want to do that in a kind of consortium with many nations. If, in a, as a kind of a separate, if you're, not, if you're talking about space as a capability, um, it's, it, it would be almost impossible to overstate the importance of space to United States national security. We're incredibly dependent. Our military is totally dependent on space assets. Uh, all of our guided munitions are GPS guided. Those satellites are actually very fragile. Um, uh, the National Reconnaissance Office satellites are super important, also quite fragile. So, um, and it's very asymmetric because we're more dependent on those high-tech assets than any other country is. They, they give us great capabilities, but they're also a vulnerability. So if you think of space, if you think about kind of Mars missions, I think they should be done um, uh, cooperatively, but if you're thinking about national security missions, we, we need to preserve our, 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 our preeminent uh, position in space. Okay. Michael, um, when you came back, um, Richard Nixon, President of the United States, greeted you on the, in the USS Hornet, uh, but you were quarantined so he couldn't really talk to you, but he, he said at the time, this was the most important week since creation, which I think you said in your book maybe it was a little exaggeration, but maybe not. Um, you were the very famous um, and the other two were very famous, but you chose not to cash in. You had beer commercial opportunities and all kinds of things. Why did you try to not really go ahead and make a lot of money out of your fame? And w was there a philosophical thing you thought about not making a lot of money out of it? I'm not against money. I'm not against making money, but I don't know. All my life I have never, uh, that's never been my objective. Uh, you know, all, Every time I've changed jobs, what I wanted to do is find something interesting. Uh, so I've looked for interesting jobs rather than money producing jobs. And, and, and if I wanted to have both, uh, oh my God, I'd have to make speeches. I'd have to go to the Washington National Air and Space Museum and be in the bottom of a, like a bowl and I can't tell who's up there and, and what's going on. And um, oh, so I don't know. So now let me ask you, now you are um, 85 years old. Yes. And you're in great shape. You just did a sort of triathlon recently, and I guess you won your age category. Maybe you won it for younger people as well. So um, are you, your motivation in life now, what is it that you would like to have as your legacy for your children and your grandchildren for what you've accomplished on Earth? Jeez, I don't know about legacy. I, li I like doing the triathlon, although the, uh, the, the training regimen is really tough. I have to swim one length in my pool run around my backyard and ride my bike into the garage. It's tough, I want to <laughs> tell you. Uh, but no, I, uh, I, I'm a good retiree. I live in Florida. I have a lot of hobbies. I watercolor paint. I, I follow Jeff on the stock market. And I, uh, uh, I just I, I read a lot. Uh, I have a lot of things going. I have two fantastic daughters. Uh, 
uh, I don't know what my legacy is. I, I guess sitting right there and there. Uh, anyway, um, I, I can't answer the question. I don't know. Ask it a different all right, way. All right, I hear a different way. Uh, do you have any regrets about the career you've had? Is there anything you would do differently? No, I've been very lucky. Uh, you know, Neil Armstrong born in 1930, Buzz Aldrin 1930, Mike Collins 1930. You don't call that lucky? Whoosh! We just we were there at the right time, uh, and okay. and so on. I've been very lucky. Hey Jeff, um, your Blue Horizon. What's uh, what, what, what Blue um, Origin? What's the where did that name come from? Blue Origin uh, is Earth is the blue planet, and it's a great place to be from. And. Um, is that a for-profit or a not-for-profit company? It's for-profit. I mean, well, it's not yet. I mean, it's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an intention for the glorious future. Um, it, it's, it's in, you know, what, what we would call investment mode right now. But, so, but yeah, I, I think it can be a profitable company. I think it's going to take a long time. It wouldn't meet a, you know, I, I did not go, uh, I did not make a big list of all of the business arenas I might enter and pick and force rank them and pick the one that I thought would have the highest return on invested capital. Um, I'm doing this because I care about it, because I think it's important. Um, but I do think it can be a self-sustaining, profitable business one day. And do you think this could be your greater legacy than even Amazon, if, if you're successful in all the things well, that... Well, uh, if you're talking about professional endeavors, right, when asked that question, what do you want on your, on your tombstone, I always like Warren Buffett's answer, world's oldest man. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I have lots of, uh, of, of, of things that, I, that are important to me and important to my heart, and uh, so mine are sitting here in this row too, but if you're talking just about professional life, um, I think that if, if Blue Origin could um, enable that next generation to really have entrepreneurial dynamism in space, that would be something I would, when I'm 80 years old, I would look back on it, I would be so happy. So for both of you, you're extraordinary Americans who had extraordinary careers. You've done great things for our country. I want to thank you on behalf of our country for everything you've done. And I, for those of you who want to learn more about Michael Collins' trip to the moon and his entire career, I highly recommend this book, Carrying the Fire, which is, I think, the best book ever written about space. Uh, and you should buy it on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much for an extraordinary evening. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Well, we do. Thank you. Well, I want to thank our speakers for a truly amazing evening. I'm a little concerned about Michael's criticism of this theater, though, since he designed and built it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, he says I Max messed it up. Okay. <laughs> the uh, well, again, thank you, Boeing, for making this possible. But mostly, thanks to all of you for being here tonight and for coming out and supporting all of our programs. It, we really appreciate it. Uh, it. Without the sponsorship, we would they would not be possible. But without your support, they would also not be worth doing. So thank you very much. Please exit by the rear of the theater and have a great evening. Good night. Thank you.